Hello. Hey. Thanks for that intro. Yes, um, we actually had you at a previous brainstorm a couple yeah, of years ago. Super so it's, fun in Aspen. Yeah, it's nice awesome. to reconnect. Totally. Um, so it's been, we're, we're celebrating an anniversary here. It's not a great anniversary, <laughs> uh, but it's been about a year since the discovery and the disclosure of SolarWinds, a giant sprawling hacking operation that affected tons of companies and a bunch of federal agencies as well. How's everything going? How are, have we recovered? Are we past yeah. it? Or is this still a dire situation? Yeah, it's a great question. So I remember that very vividly, the, uh, the revelation that came from a uh, good friend, Kevin Mandia, who was here yesterday. That's right. About the massive espionage campaign that's known as SolarWinds. Uh, I was actually a, a volunteer cyber policy lead on the Biden-Harris transition team at the time. And if there was a silver lining, it was that it really elevated cybersecurity as a national security priority for this administration. And I think we've seen that reflected in both the policies as well as the people who've been put in place over the last year. But you, know, you really have to look at this in the wider context of everything we've seen over the past year. Yes, solar winds, espionage campaign, but also the Microsoft Exchange vulnerabilities that were exploited, the Pulse Secure Connect VPN vulnerabilities that were exploited, the ransomware attack against Colonial Pipeline that shut down fuel to the eastern seaboard, the ransomware attack against JBS Foods, Kaseya, managed service provider, and then of course the ransomware attacks against schools and municipalities and hospitals. So there was the, a laundry list of exactly. terrible things that have happened. Exactly. So at the end of the day, cyber threats and in particular ransomware is now a kitchen table issue. And my goal as the head of the nation's cyber defense agency is to make cybersecurity and cyber hygiene in particular a kitchen table issue as well, and to really regain the initiative on the defense. What is your number one priority there at CISA? What is absorbing all, most of your attention? What is like the number one thing you want to accomplish? Yeah, so I mean, for me, it's all about partnerships and collaboration. So when I talk about defense and Kevin and Alex, uh, who are both great friends, and we just announced our Cybersecurity Advisory Committee this morning. They're yes, both on them, which I'm super excited about. Let's share the news. Um, yeah, so we just named today 23 members of our Cybersecurity Advisory Committee who are going to really help me build and transform CISA into the cyber defense agency that the nation needs and that the nation deserves. And so some fantastic thinkers and doers from academia, the private sector, uh, federal uh, and local government. We've got the mayor of Austin. We've got the Homeland Security Advisor for Illinois, but just a fabulous group. And really, it's about partnership at the end of the day. So you can, and Kevin's point was about the offense. So, you know, I believe in all instruments of power to get after this very difficult problem, whether that's uh, diplomacy or sanctions or indictments or military power. But at the end of the day, I think we have invested too much in the offense at the expense of the defense. And so my whole initiative is to regain the power of the defense. And how do you do that in a world where cybersecurity, if you think about it, national security priority, but it's a space where the federal government does not have monopoly power, not like counterterrorism, mm -hmm. where I spent a lot of my career. It's a space where the federal government is just a co-equal partner with the private sector because they own the vast majority and operate the vast majority of our critical infrastructure and the technology that underpins it. And so this is really about forging a collaborative relationship with the private sector, and that's why I'm psyched to be out here with you uh, spending the week in California. We've got a great event next week hosted by my friends Ted Schlein from Kleiner Perkins and Dave DeWalt from Night Dragon, bringing together all of the senior leaders of the technology companies, the ISPs, the CSPs, the cybersecurity vendors, the infrastructure companies. My boss, Secretary Mayorkas, is coming out. The National Cyber Director, Chris Inglis, is coming out. And this is really about us meeting people where they are not dragging them to Washington necessarily, but coming out to listen actively and to build what is the most important thing in any partnership, whether that's a marriage or a business relationship, and that's trust. You know, at CISA, we are trying to be not another lumbering government bureaucracy, you know, we're the, the youngest uh, agency in the federal government created at the end of 2018. You're the second ever and director of that? Second ever director, best job ever. But we were created, again, not to be another lumbering government bureaucracy. We were created to be something much more like a public-private collaborative. So my goal is we're going to move fast 
and build things, build trust, build partnership, build security. And it's all about how do we regain the initiative on the defense. Well, I think, like you said, coming out here to California and, and having this uh, and, and having these meetings with these folks, that's the perfect way to do it. Uh, not just expecting them to come go see you, but making it a two-way street. Absolutely. Um, so you announced this new advisory council of about two dozen uh, people within the industry. How did you pick who gets to be on that, and, and what are they going to be doing? Well, this is another great thing that we got from the Congress. Uh, one of the authorities is the Cybersecurity Advisory Committee to really help me uh, transform CISA into a very partnership-focused uh, agency. And so we chose people from various sectors. We chose people from state and local government, people who have deep experience in cybersecurity, technology, resilience, risk management, privacy, because that's incredibly important uh, given what we're trying to forge uh, in terms of a collective defense. So you'll see fantastic people on there. Uh, my friend Jeff Moss, uh, who uh, started DEF CON, Black Hat, he's going to help me, as I've talked about this uh, before, to really ignite the power of the hacker community, the researchers, the academics, and that again is about regaining the offense. We've seen way too much of these vulnerabilities that go to uh, nation states and then use them against us. And because we're all globally connected now, we saw this with solar winds, as you well know, we have to be able to find these vulnerabilities so that we can remediate them, mitigate risk to all of our infrastructure. Because everything is connected now, everything is vulnerable, and so we have to work together to lower the risk to the nation. I'm interested in this phrase you used, ignite the hacker community. I think when a lot of people hear the word hacker, they think, oh my god, that's scary. Uh, these are bad people who are trying to break into my stuff. Yeah. Um, so what do you mean when you say ignite the hacker yeah, community? Yeah, there's a little bit of that. But at the end of the day, uh, I'm talking about people who are the puzzle solvers, the problem solvers, the people who love to uh, get in and understand what's happening at the at the uh, basic level of a computer and who really like to break things down and build things back together. I mean, hackers to me are our problem solvers and our puzzle solvers, and I've talked a lot about this. And so what I'm talking about are sort of the white hat hackers, those who, who find vulnerabilities and responsibly disclose them because they know there's an obligation to be able to build the collective security and the collective defense of the nation. And at CISO, we work through our coordinated vulnerability disclosure program with researchers and hackers from around the world. And they help to let us know that we have vulnerabilities. So then we work with the vendors to remediate them. And then that allows us uh, to be able to patch them, makes us all safer at the end of the day. And so when you go out to a place like Black Hat, which I spoke at August when we launched our Joint Cyber Defense Collaborative, which is another thing I'm super excited about, uh, we were really appealing to that community of hackers, of researchers, of the academics who are out there trying to make the internet a better, safer, more secure place. And that's good for all of us. So uh, you mentioned this Joint Cyber Defense Collaborative Initiative that you started a, a few months ago. Yeah. Um, how does that differ from the Advisory Council that you've now put in place? Yes, yeah, so the Advisory Council, uh, 23 people who are going to meet at least twice a year, who are actually going to be impaneled to build subcommittees to work on specific issues. So igniting the hacker community, dealing with misinformation and disinformation that affects our critical infrastructure like elections, uh, turning the corner on cyber hygiene, which I think is the key thing that we need to do as a nation, because cybersecurity is not about technology in my view. It's about human behavior at the end of the day are the basic things that we can do to keep each other safe in a world where Enabling multi-factor authentication makes you 99% less likely to be hacked. In a world where 90% of those hacks are about human behavior, in a world where over 93% of successful cyber attacks start with the phishing email. It's about human behavior, MFA, uh, updating your software, thinking before you click, and really understanding that they're just some basic things you need to do to make us safer. So that's the advisory board who are gonna help me build that JCDC is the Joint Cyber Defense Collaborative. It's the ACDC with a J. And it's a great entity that we were also authorized this year. Three quick things. First, it brings together the full power of the federal cyber ecosystem. When I was at Morgan Stanley the last four and a half years, when we chatted three years ago, you know, I spent 27 years in the government. Four and a half years at Morgan Stanley, I felt like you needed a PhD in government to figure out how to deal with the government. Mm -hmm. And so we were built to be the front door 
we are the trusted front door. We bring together the full power of the federal government, but it's the place where industry can partner, and then we can go back and create that collective defense uh, in collaboration with them. And so that's, that's hugely important. It's about planning, not reacting. And then finally, it's about fixing the big thing from solar winds, and that's visibility. At the end of the day, if I'm a bad actor, my big takeaway is I can exploit domestic infrastructure because those blind spots, right? You don't want the US intelligence community surveilling domestic infrastructure, of course not. But what you want is to use the power of the technology companies who by their business model have visibility, who can provide anonymized information and trends to enable us to work together to see the dots, connect the dots, and drive down risk at scale. So that's what the JCDC is all about. And that's why these partnerships are so important. Totally. Um, I want to return to something you mentioned. Uh, you talked about elections. We've got some coming up, 2022, 2024. Um, your predecessor, Chris Krebs, he got the ax uh, because he said that the last election was secure and somebody in a position of power disagreed with him. Yeah. Um, how are you preparing for these upcoming elections? Yeah, it's a great question. So Chris, very good friend of mine, and, and frankly, that was, I think, a moral courage moment for CISA. Uh, at the end of the day, it is very important to me, I'm an independent, I'm a retired army officer, to ensure that CISA remains non-political. Federal government does not run elections. Those are run by state and local officials, and we are there to ensure that those officials regardless of what party, what affiliation, have the resources, the technical assistance, the information that they need to ensure the security and the resilience of those elections. So one of the most exciting hires, and I'm very focused on uh, building our team at CISA and have brought on some amazing people, uh, just brought on Kim Wyman, who was the Republican uh, Secretary of State for Washington. Uh, incredible experience and knowledge of elections. So she's gonna be our senior election security lead to work with secretaries of state and election officials across the country to make sure they have what they need to be prepared for 2022. And we are gonna continue the efforts that Chris started on rumor control, which is about not counter messaging, but really making sure that the American people have the facts that they need to be able to make the decisions when they're going to the voting booth. And so we're gonna to continue to make sure that we use that capability to give folks the information they need. So I wanna open the floor to questions in just a minute, uh, but before we do that, I've got one last question yeah. uh, for you. Um, you know, we started this off by talking about solar winds and, um, and we had Kevin Mandia on stage yesterday and you know, he wasn't required to make this big disclosure that this was going to happen, but he chose to. Yep. Uh, and that was a, a you know, moral courage moment. Yeah, another moral courage moment. Yeah. Um, and so I just wonder, you know, how can companies be encouraged to talk about this more openly when they get breached? Yeah. Um, I know there's some draft legislation that would require companies actually to make disclosures yeah. to the government. Um, so maybe just talk a little bit yeah, about this. Yeah, no, it's a great question. And that legislation is, is working its way through, and, and I am a supporter of it. Now, look, this is not about naming, shaming, hurting the reputation, or as my good friend Chris Inglis would say, stabbing the wounded. This is entirely Graphic. about making sure that when people get breached, when people get hacked, they know who to go to to get help, to render assistance, and very importantly, to use what I consider one of our most important superpowers, our very expansive information sharing authority that protects liability, that protects privacy, uh, to enable us to use that platform to warn others so they don't get hacked. So that's why the sooner we get that information, we can both render assistance, but also prevent other potential victims. And so I am hopeful that we'll get it, and then we can forge that continued great relationship with the with the private sector to help them deal with uh, the scourge of attacks that we're seeing. Excellent. Uh, anyone in the audience have any questions for Jen? Don't be shy. No? Okay. Oh, we've got one. Really delightful conversation. Thank you for being here. Uh, the Federal Bureau of Investigation is very active here in the Bay Area in the cybersecurity uh, uh, game, I guess we might say. How do you see your organization engaging with them or supporting them 
And how much direct engagement do you expect to have with CISOs and other security leaders of companies represented here and in Silicon Valley that are building these various infrastructure components that, uh, that the rest of the company's infrastructure depends on? Yeah, two great questions. Um, first of all, uh, FBI is a fantastic partner. Uh, Paula Bate, deputy director there, a good friend of mine from uh, when we worked CT together, Brian Vorndran, who's the assistant director for cyber, have a very, very close working relationship. And FBI is a, uh, by law, a partner with us in the Joint Cyber Defense Collaborative. It's FBI, it's NSA, it's DOD, DOJ, the defense, uh, the director of national intelligence. And we work hand in hand with them. So fabulous partnership. Uh, and I was really excited to see that because, again, when I was on the outside in the private sector, it seems a little bit disjointed sometimes, not as coherent as it needs to be. And so terrific partnership. We work closely both at headquarters but also in the field. Just as FBI has their 56 field offices, CISA has presence in 10 regions to include in Oakland and uh, all over the country. And so, again, we work closely with the field offices. Uh, the CISOs are my people, man. So we work very, very closely. In fact, on the advisory committee, we've got Maureen Allison, who's the CISO for J&J. &J. Uh, we've got Ron Green, who's the chief security officer for MasterCard. We've got really some amazing people. And at the end of the day, I think we all know whoever CISOs are out there, it's very important for CEOs to understand that cybersecurity is not just the IT guys or the security guys, it's a existential business risk and quite frankly a risk to national security given the connectivity. But at the end of the day, it's the CISOs who are doing all the hard work. And so they need to have the resources, uh, the people, the technology to enable them to be effective and successful. So I'm a champion for that and we'll continue to forge those close relationships uh, with CISOs and with CIOs. Excellent. We've got less than one minute left, so I'll just ask you very quickly, what is the top tip that people can leave here today and become more secure uh, by... En enable multi-factor authentication. How many people have MFA enabled? Oh, it's a good audience. Pretty right. much everyone. Those of you Except who you, don't, I, and then tell everybody to do that. Again, it will make you 99% less likely to get hacked. So I'm on a total campaign about MFA. So. Uh, it seems like everybody here is pretty good at it, so join me in the MFA evangelism. Great. So proselytize. Awesome. Go and spread the good word. Exactly. Uh, Jen, thanks so much for being here today. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks so much.